Hey everyone, exciting show for you today. We are gonna talk about the evolving and subtle changes already happening in the multi-family space. And to do that, we bring back our expert, Jonathan Twanley. How you doing, sir? I'm great, how are you, Michael? Good I'm to doing, see you. I'm doing very well. I was a little disappointed, I, won't, I must admit about the unemployment claims this morning, still 1.88 new claims, uh, continuing claims just over 21.5 million. So, you know, I'm looking at that going, wow, that's, that's eventually gonna hurt collections and, and all of yeah. that in my business, right? It just has to, right? This, this stimulus has to run out at some point and there will be an impact. But uh, I know we wanna talk about multifamilies because you're seeing subtle tweaks already and uh, I thought we should talk about that. Yeah, they're just, they're just you know, uh, so I'll, I'm gonna preface this by quoting something great that I heard on the radio recently and we might've even talked about this before, but, uh, the plural of anecdote is not data, right? So you have to, these are, I'm talking about single data points. Yes, no trend, so no data. trend, just a point. Yeah, I can't recognize a trend yet, but you know, nevertheless, they, they're kind of noteworthy. So let's talk about them. And you know, maybe they'll just be a blip and go away and it won't be a trend, but it could be the start of something. So we'll, we'll wait and see. But so the first thing that, uh, there's just a lot going on right now with multifamily or a lot not going on, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the, so one thing in terms of like the volume, the transaction volume. Uh, so there was some data published uh, within the last week or so that said that multifamily uh, prices, so these are the, the prices being paid for multifamily are up over same, the same month last year. So, mm. Uh, prices are were higher in April than in 2020 than they were in April 2019. Wow! Continuing the trend that we had been seeing for for higher prices, you know, they had been stable for a very long time, and they started spiking up again hmm. last year when people decided, oh, hey, we're not going to have a recession after all. Yep. I'm still not sure why people decided that that was the case, but <laughs> there was a consensus that just emerged yep. that hey, no recession, no worries, everything is fine. And people started piling into buying assets again uh, and driving prices up. Um, the uh, so that trend continued, but here's the kind of the data behind the data. So I, if you look at that simplistically, the answer is oh, Corona, no problem. Everyone's still buying multifamily. If you look behind those numbers, though, what you see is that uh, v deal volume plummeted by seventy percent. Wow. So what that means is that, you know, and it's because it takes, you know, at the fastest, you know, people who have all, you know, like big heavy institutional investors who have all the funds ready to go and can like mobilize a big team, you know, they can close in 30 days. But for a lot of the smaller deals, it's, you're talking about a 60 to 90 yeah. day closing process, Easy. right? Yeah. And, you know, between negotiating the contract and like doing the due diligence and arranging the financing and everything, it's, it's, that's how long the process is gonna take, 60, 90 days. So what that means, the stuff that was closing in April was under contract in, you know, go back 90 days. So that's March, February, January, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. before coronavirus hit. For sure. And uh, so they were contracting at the January, you know, prices. And so that stuff just, the stuff that closed just continued through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. But we know for a fact that there were a lot of deals that were pulled as soon as COVID hit, where there were even some, some fairly well publicized cases oh, yeah. of investors leaving millions on the table and earnest money that had gone hard mm -hmm. because they felt yeah, Blackstone, I think, was a big one in the Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. Because they just felt that that you know, losing millions was better than losing tens of millions, right? So yeah. uh so they they pulled those deals. And then I think a lot of those other, you know. Those deals on those shorter time shorter time frames that you know could close faster just stopped after that. So that's why you had this real drop in volume. So that drop in volume just t tells me that uh, you can't look at those numbers and say, "Oh, nothing is yeah. the matter." Although that's certainly how brokers will sell it, right? Brokers will say, "Look at the closing prices in in April; they're still going up. Look at the collections; they're all fine." Mm -hmm. uh, but the deal volume, the, the plummeting deal volume tells you the real story which is that the sellers Correct. are anxious and they they're afraid that they 
want to, you know, they're uh, afraid that they won't get the prices they want. So they're pulling the deals in the hopes that there will be a V-shaped recovery. And the buyers are also saying, hey, I, I, I'm not paying these prices. I, I, need, a, I need a discount. And yeah. there's just another sort of anecdote along these lines. I was talking to um, a, a, a big syndicator friend of mine, a guy with you know, thousands and thousands of units. And he was telling me that like, you know, he's selling deals right now, but he's also still looking at deals um, because he's always looking at deals. But he said, as a seller, he's saying, collections are 98%, uh, you know, maybe I'll give you a, a you know, two or 3% discount to kind of, you know, yeah. see what's going, you know, because of COVID, but no, everything is fine. But then he's like, but as a buyer, he's like, no, I, I'm not <laughs> interested if I'm not getting at least a 20% discount. I don't feel safe buying anything. Yeah. With that. So he's like, you know, my seller's hat is like, yeah, give me, give me the money. Yeah. And my buyer's hat is like, you know, <laughs> you're crazy. So, um, I, and I think a lot of people are feeling that way, right? So yeah. they're, I think the, the buyers are feeling very uncertain uh, and not willing to pony up. So that's one, that's one data point. Uh, second data point is uh, CMBS delinquency. So if you don't mm -hmm. know what CMBS is, these are commercial mortgage-backed securities. So what, peop what they do is the, the uh, mortgage originator gives you a mortgage and uh, then they, they package it up with a bunch of other mortgages and they sell it on to uh, other investors who are just looking for, for safe yield. Yep. And CMBS is, and I've been a CMBS borrower, so hmm. it's, it's very, uh, the, the benefit of CMBS is that you get very low rates and you can lock them in for 10 years. Hmm. The, the, the downside of CMBS is there's very little flexibility on the servicing side. And they're very rigid because they, because they have to be, because they're basically selling a bond to these right. investors. And so they can't, they really can't deviate at, at all. Right. Yeah. And, and the CMBS originators apparently, or just, you know, I think the servicers are actually like on the hook to pay the investors, even yes. if they don't get the money in. Correct. Right? So, so the servicers are very, very rigid about, about servicing these CMBS loans. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mortgage-backed securities, not the commercial mortgage-backed securities, but mortgage-backed securities are what got us in trouble in the last recession. Right? Yep. That was, the, that was the, the, the toxic you know, time bomb mm -hmm. where some very smart people got together and said, hey, these things can't possibly all default at the same time. So therefore, it's the safest thing ever. Yeah, and it's all AAA. Happened, yeah, yeah. And then what happened was it all defaulted at the same time, and we we had a huge mess. Now, probably that won't happen in in uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities because it's there those uh, you know unlike single-family houses, they have income coming in, right? Yeah. They're, they're, so, however, okay. So what we've seen though in the last this was just reported yesterday, CMBS overall huge huge spike in delinquency of, you know, of the borrowers not paying. Now, almost all that delinquency was in the you know, retail, which has been slaughtered, mm -hmm. hotels, which have been slaughtered, right? So that is to be expected. But there was also a, a, an uptick in multifamily delinquency. Wow. And not, you know, not, not a huge one, but there hasn't been a substantial uptick in multifamily delinquency since the last recession, right? right? So, um, so that's again like another data point. Not end of the world, but uh, something to keep an eye on because mm -hmm. it is, you know, at, maybe look we have a V-shaped recovery. Uh, those borrowers will be able to just catch up. There won't be defaults, but it's a it's a number to continue to look at. And the, you know the people who are at most risk of uh, defaulting are the people who bought at the, at the very top mm -hmm. and are now not collecting, you know, basically they needed everything to go right and yeah. now everything is not going right. So that's yeah, uh, actually Jonathan, real quick question there. Do you, yeah. and if you don't know this, maybe we can talk about it next week is was 2019 a record year for volume? You know, I, 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 it's gotta be been, close, I right? Yeah. yeah I, it, it may have been, um, yeah, the reason I ask that is because I'm just like you. It's the it's the 
it's the new issue. It's just the late 18, 2019 volume that is at most at risk. It, it had the mm -hmm. peak assumptions. It had the most, you know, it had 3% rent growth because, you know, that's just what happens. And, and also it had, a lot of them will have be value add bridge debt, which yes. is, that's, that's where this is well, going to fall apart. Yeah. The bridge debt is going to be the, where you're going to see the cracks, get, you know, forming and then really getting wide quickly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because what, if you have any, anybody who's got, uh, They've got, you know, they've got bridge debt that they have to, uh, they have to turn over into permanent debt mm -hmm. this year or next year. So meaning essentially it's like, you know, bridge debt is typically one, between one and three years. Sometimes yep. you can get some extensions on it, but if you don't have extensions and you've got, you know, three years or less, basically you're talking 2017, 2018, 2019 yeah. deals that are coming due soon. And those are, you know, maybe if it's 2017, you know, they're kind of like, they've got their value add done and they're, maybe, yeah. they're stabilized and, you know, maybe they'll get through it. But I think some of the later vintage yeah. uh, bridge debt is, is, is dangerous. I mean, it's going to be, th those folks may find themselves uh, refinancing into a very different environment, uh, you know, just in terms of, the risk that the, the borrowers are willing to take. So yeah. I think that they, and if cap rates, you know, it, cap rates aren't just relevant for what you pay for the asset. They're relevant for how the lenders oh, absolutely. evaluate the value of the, of the deal. Right. And that so, has definitely changed. Yeah. And if the lenders say that, you know, even if it goes up, you know, 50 basis points, right. Oh, the God. cap rate, just that much, is going to cause you to have to put up a lot more capital when you refinance, mm -hmm. and and then you know with all of the um, the additional escrows and stuff that the lenders are requiring, that's a whole bunch of additional capital, mm -hmm. and you're gonna you know I think some some investors are gonna find unable to is the money to refinance the deal. Now maybe some of these bridge lenders will extend them. And you know they'll they'll give them some extensions to, if they're if they're current and they're continuing to pay you know maybe they survive that way but mm -hmm. I think that uh, there we're gonna see something happen with some of this bridge debt um, and yeah there's no yeah. question and and you've brought up many times that if you get behind your your preferred return your pref as you call it again your experience not mine mm -hmm. uh, pretty soon it can get to a point where the general partner has really no reason to struggle right they they don't have the the whipped cream and cherry at the end, um, which is a problem. Yeah, it, it can happen. I mean, I think, you know, uh, operators who operate properly will continue to put in their full efforts in those deals, even though they're not making any money because mm -hmm. uh, they see the long term. But I think that there are some people who are less experienced or mm -hmm. less ethical or who just go belly up, yeah. you know, who just won't be able to do this. So, so we'll see. Again, still very early, still in a, in, we're not in like the fear part of the market yet. We're in the uncertainty part of the market, yep. which causes things to just kind of grind to a halt. We may emerge from this. Okay. We may not, but the problem, but the fact that nobody knows means that things are, that's yeah. the issue, right? Nobody knows. Yep. Um, yeah. Go ahead. You yeah. Doing? I was going to say, and, and what we're seeing now is we're actually seeing, is we've talked about a couple of times now that price discovery is the thing that's missing in this market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but you brought up a couple of things, which we'll talk about now that you're seeing the first, again, early, let's just call them data points. It's not a trend yet, yeah. but yeah. early seller slash listing broker behavior change Yes. Um, here recently. I think that's important to talk about because again, it is a change and you can't argue it. Now, is it a trend? We're not calling it yet, but it is a change. Why don't we talk about that? Yeah. So uh, I am, I saw this is, again, just one data point. Somebody posted in my group a a multifamily, pretty large multifamily deal that had an asking price on the listing. Hmm. Now, this is, this is a very subtle point, um, but a significant one because sure. we haven't seen asking prices on listings for a very long time, except <laughs> in really rare circumstances. Like they, sometimes they'll come up on deals that are just, you know, really bad markets or really languishing or whatever they 
whatever they are, you know, for some reason they can't, they just can't sell them. But uh, asking prices on commercial deals, uh, the change is significant because during, you know, I haven't seen one for ages. And the reason I haven't seen one is because in a hot market, when you're, when a broker is trying to create a bidding war, they don't want to accidentally cap the price by putting a sticker price on it. Right. Mm -hmm. They just, they want investors to go and underwrite the deal and try to be thinking, what am I going to have to do to get get this deal? How much are you going to have to pay? They want them to then go and like, you know, usually they're going through a couple rounds of bidding. They're going there. They put in their first bid and then they pick the, you know, the top five and they say, Mm -hmm. okay, you're in the best and final. So, you know, now come with your real bid because we all know you're holding something back. Um, And, and the, the idea is to try to, you don't want to have a, a listing price on it because people will not bid very much above that listing price. Right. right? Um, it, you know, it's not like, it's not like a, a single family house that has listing prices on it where they know that people will get emotionally invested in getting the house and overbid because right. it's a different calculation in, in a commercial setting. It's like, okay, how much risk am I going to take given the cash flows of this property or what I think I can accomplish with value add on this property. So there is some kind of upper limit that people have based on their return expectations. But, uh, you know, there are always inexperienced people or very aggressive people or, you know, people who have a, a, a different, you know, they, they're doing some kind of financial engineering or who knows what it is that, mm-hmm. that will cause them to, to value this property higher potentially than that asking price. So the brokers don't want to accidentally cap those bids right? right but when it turns into a buyer's market then the opposite happens because yeah. now the brokers are afraid that you're going to go and underwrite the deal very conservatively you know just do everything super conservatively and come in with very low bids on the deal so they're trying to anchor you to a higher number so that they know that you're going to bid under whatever the asking price is as soon as they stick an asking price on it, but they're trying to, they're trying to like, let's just say that you see that asking price and your own valuation for the deal is 10% below that. They're hoping that they can get you to just bid 5% below the asking right. price because you sort of split the difference in your mind. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you're, or you're worried about not getting the deal or whatever it is. So they're trying yeah. to, they're trying to anchor you, you know, up. So from, not, from not falling too far below. Yep. Whereas, you know, in the, in the buyer's market, they're trying to, they not don't want to limit. anchor you to any, yeah. they, They're trying not to limit you. So right. the fact that this deal showed up and it's not like a small deal, it's like an $18 million deal. Uh, the fact that it showed up with an asking price is potentially significant. Now, again, we don't know. This is yeah. one deal. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a data point. It's not a trap. Uh, but no, but, these are just the early signs that, yeah. again, I always tell people, you got to learn your market, learn your market. I mean, it's, it's, I say it's probably my most repeated phrase on this channel. And it's these, when you watch your market, these are the early signs you see that you're like, aha, that's different, right? Yeah. That changed. And when you're early, yeah, sometimes it's a single data point, single deal, but I'm willing to bet you that that becomes far more common. This one may be early, but by December, I think you're going to see a lot more. So um, that's, and, that's pretty cool. And I'm not seeing, you know, this isn't multifamily because, again, I think a lot of the multifamily has, uh, has gone off market. Right. Um, now, we haven't talked about this yet, right? So not yet. Um, but that's the second the, one. Again, be- behavior is changing. Yeah, behavior is changing. So, so I, I'm seeing just in the volume of email I get uh, listing deals um, from brokers just dramatically Plumped. dropped off. Yeah. Uh, which is consistent with that deal, you know, mm-hmm. the, the deal flow closing, uh, dropping. Uh, I, before I get into like kind of the significance of this, the, um, I, I, but I have noticed, I, so people add me to their list all the time. Like I get completely unsolicited <laughs> stuff. I'm not even, in, you know, people, you know, put me on their list to sell like, you know, triple net, you know, Sure. McDonald's deals in, <laughs> in like, you know, Washington state, like something I'm like a never going to invest in, but I see all this stuff. And what I've noticed recently is on the triple net side, I've seen a number of emails come through that say new pricing. Now new ah. pricing is broker speak for price cut. They don't want to say price cut. So right. new pricing. I find that very interesting because triple net deals have 
you know, tradi- traditionally been like the most conservative. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's the cap rates are traditionally very low on those deals because yeah. it, you know, it's supposedly it's a, you know, you're looking for some triple A rated, you know, large company that's going to pay the, 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 the rent on that thing, no matter, you know, even if that, that particular uh, store is losing money, mm-hmm. you know, they're still going to pay the rent. So um, those have been traditionally very low cap rate deals because they're so they're seen as very secure. The fact that those deals are not trading and you're getting price cuts is, is significant, but yeah. back to multifamily. So related to what we were talking about, about the, the sticking a price on stuff, there's, I've been reading in the trade press that a lot of deals are now going off market mm. and not being listed at all. And the reason is related. The reason is that the, the sellers are concerned that if a deal is listed now, the perception in the market will be that it's distressed mm. and they're desperate to sell because of everything. Then why would you list it in this environment? You must right. be desperate to sell. And therefore they're not going to get the bids that they, that they want. And, and just to understand sort of why they would still put the deal on the market now is because, you know, they probably made the decision to sell a year ago and mm-hmm. they've been preparing the deal to say, you know, to sell, which means like cleaning up your, cleaning up your financials, cleaning yeah. up your balance sheet, like, you know, making the deal look really good, uh, getting, yeah. getting, you know, rid of your bad debt, like all the kind of stuff that you, you yeah. know, you're trying to like make it pretty it up. And, yeah. and you're probably also doing some, you know, some stuff to the property itself, just kind of making it look better. So it, it you know, for the, a lot of very professional investors, this is a, a year long process or you're working with your management company to get the deal ready to sell. Mm-hmm. So they've just spent this year preparing and now Corona's happened and everything else has happened and they, they don't want to, you know, stop or maybe they have to sell because they've got to refinance soon, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe uh, they have a, for whatever reason, there's a mandate. They have to sell it in a certain period of time. Yeah. Right. Uh, for their, under their fund rules or who knows what the reason is, but there, there are reasons that they have to sell. And, um, they are taking these deals off market because they think that the off market route is the way to get a better price. Interesting. And what they're hoping is that, that again, they'll, the brokers will be taking these deals to a, a limited number of buyers to so kind of fit the profile, hope to get a little bit of a bidding war going there, right. but avoid. And, and then the brokers can like control the story that's being told to the potential buyers and hopefully not have to take uh, in a way that maybe if they went to market, the idea is somehow the perception would be that, uh, you know, it's distressed. So another little kind of data point about how the market dynamic has yeah. shifted. And that, that's, in, again, this, this is what happens when you learn your market. And again, uh, it's these subtle things that when a buyer's market switches to a seller's market, right? In a seller's market, you want to throw it out to the largest population you can because you never know where that stupid buyer may come from, right? Someone who just overpays because. And you're then you, looking for dumb money. Yeah, you're, you're looking, looking for, for dumb, dumb money. money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in a buyer's market, you're looking for certain money, right? You're looking for somebody that's got to get it done, right? Because you have a reason to sell. Yeah. yeah. And, and, those, and those, those, you know, brokers are probably also taking those deals out to folks that they know, say, are, have a 1031 that they have to complete. Sure. Right? Or, you know. Yeah, there's a clock. Yeah. So they're trying to find, as you say, those certain buyers, like people who need to buy right now. Yeah. There are, there are certain buyers who have reasons that they, they need to buy for some reason. Yeah. For so sure. this, and the, and the, the brokers know who those buyers are. So they're just taking it to them and hoping that they can, you know, yeah. still get a decent price. Shotgun marriage. <laughs> for that, for that seller. Yeah. Uh, and then the final data point, uh, again, it's small, but, um, something to just to just watch is that uh multifamily collections are coming in a little bit slower than last month so we've seen the collections be good throughout this uh this crisis because uh either people are using their savings or they've got uh government stimulus money or you know lots of people still are working uh Mm -hmm. they're just working from home 
So we haven't really seen a lot of sort of rental distress yet. Mm -hmm. it, collections are a little bit behind. I mean, they're not, they're not, yeah, points. People are not collecting yeah. at 100% of what they were, but they've been collecting at 90, 95, 96, 97% sure. of what they're usually collecting. And um, so it's held up fairly well. It's held up much better in the A and B space than it has in the C space. The C space is showing more signs of weakness, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, but this month, uh, it was just reported. Now we're very early. It's only the fourth of the month, and this is so. This is data for just like the first couple of days, but rent collections are running a couple points behind where they were for the last two months. And mm. and this is something. If this is, you know, we'll see how the, how this plays out for the rest of the month. Um, but you know, this is Thursday, so June the first was a Monday, right? So mm -hmm. there's no weekend issue here. Yeah. No no muddy data. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's. Uh, this is what you and I have been talking about for a while. For sure. The thing to watch is what happens when people have started to spend through their savings or they've spent through their 3,400, whatever, what, their 1,200 plus children, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, how much ever they got. They're spending, they've spent through their, through their, uh, your stimulus check, right? Yeah. And now they're into unemployment. And some people, you know, there's been a lot of, in some cases, anger about people getting paid more on unemployment than they would normally make um but that's that's only certain people most yeah. people on unemployment are making less than they would normally make even with the additional money sure. that they're getting from the government so we're starting to see um you know you would expect people to run down their savings and and let's face it i mean americans don't have <clears throat> have a lot of savings they're not you know they're not well positioned cash wise yeah. Uh, you know, for, for for much deeper reasons, but um, there's not a lot of cushion out there. And so, uh, if there's if people start spending their their savings um, mm -hmm. and they blow through that, then if there's no stimulus money come, you know, no more stimulus money coming through, then we're going to see um, some some issues. And and I think again, you know, economies are reopening. You know, New York City is one of the last to reopen. We're, we're reopening next week. Um, but I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know how effective it's going to be. I mean, I, I was talking to, you know, the restaurant, a lot of the restaurants around here are open for takeout and, sure. and they've changed, you know, I love this. They've changed the law in New York city. So you can like stand outside and have a drink on the sidewalk, which is it's great. Yeah. Before you couldn't <laughs> do it. it. Yeah. You couldn't do it before. Now you can. So I hope they don't change that back. Um, <laughs> But the, um, so I was out at one of the local uh, bars uh, having a drink and I was talking with the owner and he said something very interesting to me, which is that he was talking to some of his uh, sort of restaurant industry friends yeah. who were from, let's just say states that didn't, were opposed to the, the lockdowns and, okay. you know, were, and didn't want people, were, they don't want to wear masks and, and the whole thing. So mm -hmm. he said that, he was talking to some of his friends in those states okay. and they expected that as soon as the lockdowns were over, they'd be filled and they are not. People are not coming out even in those places. So um, this, yeah. I, we're Consumer not psychology. Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, people are, people are not, uh, people have changed habits for yep. one thing. For sure. They're, they're used to staying at home. Uh, they're used to ordering stuff online. Uh, but also, I think people are still not, they really are concerned about Corona. They don't, you know, we're, we, despite the fact that the news has gone, you know, with the protests, nobody's really focused on Corona anymore. Right. I think people are still, uh, they're concerned about it. I mean, I don't, yeah. you know, I don't it's think. done a good job of scaring people, for sure. Well, scaring or, or educating them. Educating, whichever one, yeah. it, whichever whichever one it is, whichever yeah. one it is, like, whichever is true. Uh, the the fact of the matter is that people are not rushing out to take a chance. Nope. And you know, and yeah. and and a lot of the restaurants are only allowed to open at partial capacity anyway. And so, I, I, there there are just businesses that are going to fail and go away yeah. because of this. Yeah, it's and, already happened. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of businesses are going to realize that even if they could get through this with PPP or whatever it is. They just can't operate at 60% capacity. I mean, I, I saw yeah. Delta Airlines the other day that's not going to sell any middle seats 
in their airplanes yeah. for the next 90 days. I mean, they're not profitable doing that. They're going to get through it. They have some, you know, they have billions of dollars in, in you know, basically fed loans, but yeah. most small businesses can't operate. They didn't sign a lease at that. They don't have a cost structure for that. You know, you just, you're just going to be, it's ne negative cash flow. That, that would be called a negative cash flow house, right? Yeah. Do you really want to feed that house every month? That's a huge alligator. And eventually that, you know, you blow up, you get tired of that. And that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, reading something on, on Seeking Alpha the other day, which I, I thought was kind of ridiculous. Like they, they, they were talking about how, well, we don't really have to worry about all these restaurants and stuff going out of business because what's going to happen is, you know, new restaurateurs are going to come in and there's all these fully equipped restaurants <laughs> that, that they can just step into and start running. And I was like, maybe five years from now, that's true, but it's not like this is going to happen yeah. like in the next six months because we're still going to have, even if there are no more restrictions, yep. there are still going to be uh, people who are wary about going out. And, and I personally feel like if they were, if, 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 you know, every government in the entire world and the WHO and the CDC and like every, you know, private corporation in the world were suddenly to make this announcement that like, you know what, we got it wrong. There's no COVID. It, we just made a mistake. Sorry, guys. Made, made a mistake. mistake. Whoops. 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 Sorry. Like, even if that were to happen, I think you would still have like 25% of the population that wouldn't believe it. Oh, and, no, no question. And, Absolutely. And, and would, and would, uh, would still be, or even if they believed it, they'd still be like, yeah, I believe it, but yeah, uh, still you first. <laughs> yeah, you first. Exactly. And, and so I think that that's going to have an impact and, you know, we need to be prepared for that. So yeah. um, I, I think, again, like we keep on keeping our fingers crossed, but I think the reason why volume is down in multifamily pricing is down in multifamily, like is because nobody knows yeah. where this is going. And they, so they have to plan for the worst case scenario as an investor. And now that the markets are, you know, seized up until, like you said, we have, you keep on eloquently calling it price discovery, right? Until we know yeah. what the price of things is, nobody is willing to buy anything. Yeah, I think what we, are, what we are going through in real time, and I love how these are recorded every week, is we are seeing firsthand a switching from a seller's market to a buyer's market, right? We were, we were kind of in the mess for four to eight weeks. Now it's 10 weeks in, we're starting to see some sellers just have to sell which will lead to price discovery, which leads to, you know, changes, right? I.e. listing a price, i.e. let's try off market and look for people that have to buy, you know, it's just the behavior I think is changing. And then you see the cracks because the business cycle is real, right? With CMBBS, um, you know, delinquencies going up even in multifamily. I just think we are seeing in real time, well, at least weekly, a switching from a seller's market to a buyer's market. And it's messy and it's, it feels uncomfortable, but, we, we, we've both been saying this for years. It's going to happen. And it's just happening in right in front of yeah. us right now. And, and really fast, you yeah. know, like, but I think that's how, but I think that's how these things happen. They Absolutely. Happen very yeah. suddenly, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it takes a market take a long time to, to climb to the peak and then they very suddenly drop. Right. Yeah. So um, now one yeah. other, one other thing I think mm -hmm. is a, something that multifamily investors need to think about and they can't, there's no way to, there's no way to get at this information yet, right? Mm. Which is, um, are people going to continue to want to live in uh, apartments on top of one another? No, right? I, I've like, been calling that so, for a month or so. That that is yeah. a trend that is going it, it, at least short term, and let's call it a year or two. Yeah, that is a that is no good. Space is good today. That's that is clear. Yeah. So, are people going to want to? Uh, to the extent that they can, right? Because I think yeah. renting a single family home is more expensive than For renting sure. an apartment because you have, it's better, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so it will be at the margins, mm -hmm. but at, at the, so the margins are important, right? Because if, if you, you know, if vacancy for, mul for you know, multifamily goes down by two, three percentage points, that that's going to, yeah translate into discounted prices, right? Oh, so, for sure. I, uh, I don't know if you saw this, Jonathan. Did you see San Francisco? And maybe it's just my local paper. San Francisco lease rates for April. So it's, it's a month old, but I, I read it in May. We're with lease rates, meaning the rent, was down 9.7%. Yeah. 
Yeah, I saw. That's huge. I saw, yeah, I saw that. It's it's incredible, and um, you know, I've been. You know, I, I I live in New York, but I don't focus on on owning here for a whole host of reasons. But I mean, I, you know, the things I look at are suburban multifamily in the South. Yeah. And even there, though, even for those kinds of assets, you know, you've got people packed into, you know, yeah. not packed, but not packed. I mean, you've got people like in, say, like garden apartments and you've got, you know, 10 buildings and they've yeah. each got 12 apartments in them. And, you know, maybe they've got a balcony. Probably. Probably, probably they have a balcony and the first four people have a little bit of a backyard. But they don't really have a lot of space. They can't really go run around. There's a pool, but they're probably not going to use it, right? Yep. And uh, those people, and they're still like running into their neighbors, you know, yeah. they've got to go to the rental office, good. Pay their yeah. check, like they, all these things where they're having contact with people that maybe they right now don't really want to, and they can't get away. Like yep. some of those people are going to say, you know what, I, I'm just going to go rent a house instead. No question. And so I think that, and it may be more at the top of the market than at like your C properties, but there's, there's going to be some mm -hmm. in every, you know, and uh, I, this is again like an unknown factor that needs to be, you know, how, how is your vacancy going to be affected yeah. oh, I, by by all of these different factors? It's not just people losing jobs, but the people who have jobs. How many of them are going to decide it's go it's time to go buy a house, yep. or it's time to go rent a house? No question, so, it's going to be so, significant. It's going to be worse than most people expect, in my opinion. I'm obviously a residential guy. That's where I focus. So I could obviously be talking my book. I get it. But class A apartment dwellers um, have liked the amenities, have liked the flexibility. I don't own anything. If my job changes, I can move. You know, if I, you know, that was, that was a good thing the last four or five years, specifically for millennials. Everybody remembers the last crisis. Today, the crisis says space is good. I'm already seeing it. I mean, we saw it, I think it was a week ago with new construction. Uh, purchases. It was up. It was up almost 1% on an expectation of negative 22%. New construction is selling because class A apartment folks who have the financial wherewithal and are still working are going, screw this. I'm going to go buy a house. Yeah. It's happening. It, we're seeing it here in, in New York where the brokers, you know, in the surrounding suburbs mm -hmm. are, are having their phones ran off the hook yeah. because people are saying, you know what? And maybe these were people who all along were like, you know, eventually nah. we have kids. We're going to like, it's, it's time maybe. to, you know, some of them, right. Some, yeah, but but some. I'm sure some of them, people are just have accelerated yes. their, uh, their plans no right? because they were always planning to move out to the suburbs eventually anyway, because they just want more yeah, space. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. But there, <laughs> but there are probably some other people who were like, were never really thinking about it. And yep. then now they're like, I can't stand being cooped up in my apartment anymore. Yeah. You know, that freaking I, neighbor does this or that, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I didn't realize because they were at work all day. They don't realize the neighbor is noisy during the day. And now they got to make their house, their gym, their school, their work and where they live. I yeah. mean, that's crazy. Yeah. The, space, the, the need for space for people who can afford it. Space is, is good. That's, yeah, the, that's is, the lesson. At least for the next couple of years, right? Yeah. So, one or two yeah. years for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is good, man. I think, I think we are seeing... Uh, a switching. Again, the data points are data points. We'll, we'll call a trend in three or four weeks. Uh, I do think there's one thing that you and I talked about as a data point a month ago, which is what we just discussed. Is there really going to be a move from vertical living to suburbia? I think we've seen that for four or five weeks. Now the answer is yes. Uh, you know, we've seen rent rates come down at least in San Francisco already. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty good at this. We, we, we call out data points early, uh, but you know, we'll see what happens going forward. This is a lot of fun, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out with the For suburban sure. multifamily, right? Because so far, what I'm hearing from people is strong traffic still, people are renting. Uh, we haven't, there hasn't been a drop off yet, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see how, we'll see how, how it plays out. Very so. cool, man. Well, thank you very much. And we will, of course, talk next Thursday morning. Absolutely. Thank see you, you. then. Uh-huh.